You'll have to bear with me a little bit. The uh, monitor is mirroring, so I have to find my mouse. There we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so. I, I think that the um, ambition of this lecture series is a great one, and, um, and it was relatively easy to prepare to talk about research and its impact on my teaching and practice because those two things that I do are um, constantly informing one another and are um, wrapped up in one another. So I'm going to bounce around a little <laughs> bit. Um, first by sort of setting out um, a seri uh, basically an argument about, um, about something called sheet logics, which came out of some very initial teaching that I did at UCLA and has informed a series of projects um, that you'll see from practice and a series of projects of my students. Um, so you can turn that off. Thank you. Um, so sheet logics is, is basically, um, it's both a geometric and a material um, concept about how um, you bring the organizational and the cosmetic together in the design of environments. And um, this uh, involves most um, immediately the impact of, of 
approaches to model making, whether they be physical or digital, that involve sheets rather than solids. So in the move from, um, from one form of physical model, say the physical model of, of my education in the early 90s, um, to what is uh, primarily a place of study of the architectural model, which is a digital environment, um, how does that transition from working with solids? The early um, digital modelers worked in solids, so you actually worked with primitives and you modified those primitives or assembled those primitives to generate organization. And it really built on a kind of figure ground understanding of how you would generate architectural order. Um, and so in, when um, digital modeling moved to, um, to um, surface modeling, you, there were different tendencies that emerged in organization that were possible because of changing tools. So as um, an interest in digital fabrication grew, um, designers turned to surface as the primary site of their research. By the late 90s, an interest in surface had firmly taken hold in professional practice as both an organizational and cosmetic device. Rather than view these as separate, the design framework of sheet logics brings them together. Surface is replaced by the term sheet because it refers both to topology and substance, to geometry and material. Surface, on the other hand, refers to the exterior boundary of an object is defined as part of a whole. Sheets contain parts, but can expand and respond to contingency without losing their overall organizational coherence. So it's in the area of sheet logics that um, I think disciplinary research opens up. So this is a series of points that were basically formulated following some teaching some teaching that I'll show you. And I'll, I'll try to move kind of quickly through them, but it sort of situates a series of discrete problems that are opened up um, when working topologically. Um, so sheets avoid the solid logics typically associated with descriptions of mass. Unlike surfaces, sheets need not conform to the organizational constraints of a geometric solid. Solid logics align spatial boundaries with geometric boundaries, and space is conceived as mass or its absence. Figure ground relationships emerge from solid logics, while sheets distribute events across a field. So these are just two slides, one of the Jesu um, library by OMA from 1992, um, where the logic of a series of folded um, of sloping ramps distributes program along a continuous floor plate. Um, the other, which follows a kind of solid logic, is the Tregram Bibliotheque, OMA's competition entry from 89, um, for the National Library of France. Um, and in here, the entire mass was conceived of a solid full of floors of repetitive stacks, and the programmatic volumes were, um, were a variety of solids that were bullioned from that kind of mass of stacks. Sheet logics unseat figure ground as the chief organizing principle of planning and massing strategy. Figuration emerges, emerges across a field and at scales both small and large. Figure, figure, ground, ground relationships are possible. Here's an example by Zaha Hadid of the Dubai Opera House. The fundamental design concerns of massing are part of early sheet production rather than emerging from the conventions of material assembly. So um, formal questions associated with massing um, require novel approaches when using sheets. This is necessary because the tropes developed for, the, for solid masses 
um, provide insufficient solutions to questions of how a sheet might meet the ground, how it meets the sky, um, how it deals with discontinuities such as aperture or changes in material. So the first slide was Sauna's Rolex Learning Center um, from 2010, where, um, uh, where the massing of the project is basically defined by two parallel surfaces that depart and touch the ground um, in a variety of ways to produce space under and uh, within the project. The um, Herzog and Demeron's Prada store which um, you know is hard to classify as I, either working with solid logics or sheets. Its surfaces are are conceived of as unfolded surfaces, and its massing still kind of presents itself as a prismatic solid. So it's a kind of strange hybrid. But here, um, the way in which it meets the plane um, the plane of the ground is unusual because its mass completely defies um, adjustment in the face of its ground plane. With sheets, there's no hierarchy of relationships between master plan, building organization, ornament, and detail. So these formerly distinct phases of design dissolve. Um, building organization and ornament can be generated simultaneously. Ornament is freely distributed across the sheet as intensity is within it. So an example here to illustrate this point is um, Gary's, Gary Partners Experience Music Project in Seattle, where sheet manipulations occur at the master plan scale. It accommodates the arrival of the, of the um, monorail it connects the museum to the park, and then it also deals with um, this sort of vehicular edge and the urban fabric um, that's adjacent to the park. And so entry, arrival, massing are all kind of mediated through the, through the manipulation of surface. Sheets are featureless, boundless, and scaleless until operated upon and deployed. Um, here's an example of a project by um, Greg Lynn, which uses a series of strips of material which roll up into tubes and then are bundled to um, produce a, a, a different typologies of building from canopy to gallery to museum massing. Minor operations have major formal repercussions. This is um, a sort of uh, very familiar series of um, simple cuts done, simple cuts and folds done to a paper model to produce the Jisoo library diagram. Sheets require tectonic inventiveness. Um, sheets require tectonic solutions that respond to local differences without compromising overall coherence. Cartesian systems producing abstract ordered fields of geometry um, that downplay materiality in, in favor of spatial measure, while sheets provide form active tectonic performance without being reduced to a single idealized structural profile. This is an early new form project, a competition proposal for the Queens Museum of Art Strategy in Flushing Meadows Park in New York. Um, and this was a hybrid structural system of a rigid shell. Um, the, rig the rigid shell produced lateral stability and a suspension net system um, did all the dead load work of the project, and so these two systems produce a kind of unexpected atmosphere <laughs> below the space of the museum. Sheets confound material expectations. Sheets imbue surfaces with material qualities rarely associated with architectural production. Surfaces are rendered material rather than abstract. Sheets exhibit posture that results from its material behaviors. They drape, recline, or billow, depending on their weight and material properties. Um, 
here you can see something that I'm really deeply interested in, which is the degree to which the architectural model and its methods of production affect the um, qualities and possibilities of the full-scale building. And that was a model of IAC headquarters by Gary Partners. Sheets encourage the commingling of the representational and the material. Sheets are the primary site of digital description. They operate as the backgrounds of drawings, primary visual material of three-dimensional modelers, and the products of numerically controlled machines. The commingling of the representational and the material allow the synthetic to alter the real. When digital information inhabits physical environments, um, the, the mixture produces kind of synthetic qualities that that real materials can't do on their own. Um, here's the actual built um, uh, photograph of the IAC headquarters, and here the representational is the um, ceramic frit that alters the opacity of the glass curtain wall. Sheets move beyond the single surface problem. Um, that's a longer disciplinary argument, but um, uh, in the single surface problem, basically this is um, characterized by, um, by Diller and Scafidio's I-beam competition and then relentlessly copied and worked on and practiced by everyone, including many of our students, I'm sure. Um, but a sheet is not necessarily defined by its capacity to be unrolled onto a plane without tearing. So if you um, introduce other methods for the description of sheets, you can work on other problems outside of the single surface problem. Scissors can have their way with sheets. Um, other geometric sensibilities are readily accommodated by sheets. They can be manipulated using cutting operations at a variety of scales, and at fine scales, cutting alters sheet materiality with techniques like perforation, striation, etc. And at medium scales, cutting manipulates profile and silhouette. At large scales, cutting produces sheet boundaries that relate to urban or local site conditions. Sheets are sided, unlike solids that are conceptualized of, of the same medium throughout, sheets have sides. And this sidest, sidedness can be exploited to condition different atmospheres around it. Um, this is often choreographed by the application of graphic material. This is future systems competition entry for the Czech National Library. Um, graphic material readily adheres to sheets. Cosmetic effects are possible when deploying sheet logics. Graphic material including color, texture, pattern, and imagery are easy, easily introduced to sheets using a variety of technologies. Sheets expand the expressive and performative capacities of seams. Um, rather than reluctantly accept seams as a byproduct of assembly constraints, sheets foreground the capacity of seams to perform at larger scales. Seams can radically alter silhouette using techniques borrowed from garment construction. This is an example of an installation um, my office did last summer. I'll talk about a bit more. So that's the sort of laborious research-oriented part. Um, let me, whoops, you don't want to see that yet. Um, so, um, I've written a little bit about the influence of, um, of digital techniques on architectural production, especially with regard to the Southern California context, which is not one that's native to me. I've just 
lived there now for, I guess, about a quarter of my life. So it's starting to become um, part of how I think. Um, but uh, there, we're basically digital fabrication has been, um, digital design has been uh, part of the context of the entertainment industry and um, in the era, um, uh, aircraft, um, aeronautical uh, industries and in different forms of manufacture. So we have the ability to work with digital fabrication tools and also to see the impact of digital production on culture. So if you see a movie like Avatar, you see these sort of strangely familiar yet um, hybridized and very synthetic environments that are produced um, by combining things we know, like an aquatic environment and a forest, and you get an, a kind of biome that's unfamiliar on Earth, but that we um, can recognize. Uh, also in Southern California, you have BMW Design Group, you have Boeing, um, there's high-tech product design and toy design, and all of these different industries use these um, tools to, to um, put objects in the world and to, um, to prototype them and manufacture them. And then I refer back to um, Gary quite a bit because I think he has actually done incredible things for the discipline that are under-conceptualized um, in writings about him or in his own speaking about the work that I find kind of fascinating. And, um, and they really operate at, at the two scales of craft um, at which I'm interested, the craft of the architectural model and, um, and the crafting of novel forms of uh, building assembly. And so these are just uh, two of his projects. And then this is, um, is basically an illustration from an, art, an A plus U article I wrote trying to discuss the impact of these prototyping technologies on the projects that LA architects make. So this is a whole range of installations, buildings, competitions, um, that are produced with the technologies at hand. Um, this one by a colleague, Greg Lynn, um, who did a kind of new approach to the modular wall. Um, and so uh, at UCLA, there are a number of people, not just me, um, who are working on related ideas. This is um, something that I'll show a little bit of later, but this is an unrolled model from a studio called um, Fabric Fantasies, which is basically the kind of instigator to the whole argument about sheet logic. So um, students were introduced to garment making techniques and were asked to reconceive of the architectural model and organization more generally through um, the use of garment making techniques instead of through lofting and rhinoceros or um, through um, laser cut bristol board models. So essentially the students had to start with a physical model, um, the material of which exhibited certain behaviors and the techniques of which were um, imported from another discipline. Um, and then in terms of material assembly and an interest in craft, I'll show this work in more detail, but this is a course where we go to the other extreme of scale and we prototyped facade systems at one-to-one -one scale. So instead of really focusing on the architectural model, we're instead focusing on uh, material assembly and on manufacturing constraints and designing um, organizational potential from that scale backwards. 
Um, and then this will return to at the end, but um, we've recently kind of expanded that um, interest in digital fabrication across a series of material systems. So this was um, a core graduate studio that we taught last year um, looking at um, digital design and fabrication and its um, impact on facades of metal, concrete, and polymers. So that kind of gives you the lay of the land in terms of the research orientation. And then I will show you some of my um, professional work, which by contrast looks much less complex. Um, so I'm sure I'll have questions about that. So this is a house that um, is under construction now. It's called the Vortex House. Um, its ambition lies in its production of a dramatic spatial um, environment in the context of the urban wilderness interface of Malibu, um, California. So. The site is basically where this fireball has erupted. It luckily erupted prior to the start of construction, but this is the site, um, another view of the site. Um, the project attempts to saturate its interior with the visual and geometric material of the surrounding site. Rather than understand the views as a way to release the interior to the exterior, the surrounding geometric and topographic features of the landscape are drawn into the, into the house's interior to condition its atmosphere. Artificial and natural geometries are characterized as of the same fluid medium and the house of vortex into which the material is drawn. This ambition informs each part of the house's organization its folded roofscape, five-sided sculptural mass, and its exterior wrapper and covered patios. So um, the site is basically on a flat plateau that's surrounded by a really rugged, mountainous landscape. The ocean is to the bottom of this screen. There's a 200 degree view of the Pacific, a thousand feet below. And the um, mountains continue up behind the house, which is north and facing up. So the massing um, is basically derived out of an interest in having every space of the house have two views of exposure to the ridge line and distant views. So this is a kind of unrolled um, ridge line, roof line, and then um, an unrolled interior elevation, which um, shows the relationship of the folded roof of the house to the landscape beyond. Um, and this um, is in a way, a, a bit like taking um, uh, Lautner's Arango house and taking the living space, which is beneath the terrace, and pulling it up to the terrace underneath the canopy above. And here, it, the, on the upper kind of entertaining terrace, the canopy and the terrace basically frame the landscape beyond and are essentially um, they create a datum against, against which you understand the changes in the landscape. In the Vortex House, the ambition's a bit different. It's to actually um, uh, modulate the space of the house while the landscape, um, uh, while the modulation of the landscape is on view, and those two are then put into relationship through the aperture of the apertures of the house. So these are some kind of renderings, earlier renderings of the house, um, the floor plan of the house. So the um, lower series are a series of 
um, views that are just diagrammatically showing what the surface of the ceiling is doing um, in relation to the circumnavigation of the plan. Um, and this is a view from the southwest. And then um, the vor there's a kind of double, um, a double performance of the vortex that um, other thing that the involuted wrapper does is it allows the house to be naturally ventilated and respond to prevailing wind directions. Um, and also um, in the middle of the house is a courtyard, which it's quite a small house. It's a, um, under a lot of development pressure. So the footprint, uh, everything about the house was extraordinarily regulated. Um, so in order to make, to expand the apparent scale of the house, we have a small um, courtyard open to the sky. And then these are the elevations, some early massing models. Um, and the structural diagram of the house is really a hybridized system. In the middle is a diagram of um, the dead load the primary dead load system, which is um, a steel frame without moment connections. Um, and, uh, well, without moment connections, that resists seismic. So it's, it's basically um, a steel system with welded connections, but just to deal with dead load. And then around that system and encasing that system are a series of really conventional timber framed walls and those walls resist seismic so it's a kind of less expensive way to deal with um, with construction in a seismic zone but what the steel members do is it allows us to modulate the space of the house and instead of having um, rafter ties that um, uh, counteract thrust we instead are able to keep the space of the house rising to meet the roof. And so this, I'm just going to go through fast because these aren't that interesting, but it's nearly done. It's getting close to being done. Um, you can see the steel frame there. So um, uh, all of the members are basically moving in three-dimensional space. So um, really for us, the, the digital, um, you know, the primary digital tool was just in having um, the ease of communication to the steel fabricator and for our own use and understanding what the design um, was going to be. But um, the methods of construction are relatively conventional. I keep thinking I'll be able to give a lecture where it's finished, but it's not finished yet. Um, this is the north facade where it's the only place where the roof of the house slips beyond the boundaries of the wall, and this um, accommodates the front entry. Um, its roof is clad in standing seam zinc. And here you can see um, the the underside of the roof and the way in which it modulates the interior elevation of the wrapper and also the space of the house. And this is this um, one point where the steel frame of the house um, um, and the geometry of the roof doesn't coordinate with the perimeter of the house. So there's a place where one beam kind of gets daylit in the space and this king post collects all of the other beams and the kind of steel frame of the building is revealed. And this is basically the state that the house is in now. It's waiting for its finished coat and its deck.
The next project I'll show you is also a house. This one's called the Succulent House. Um, this project was completed last, I guess, a little over a year ago. Um, we were invited by um, the um, editors of a recently published 306090 called Making a Case to, um, to uh, produce an architectural proposal that responded to um, a contemporary crisis in American housing. And so um, I'll kind of lay out the argument for this house. Um, the contemporary American house is experiencing a deepening crisis of identity in this era of growing environmentalism. This identity crisis began nearly 50 years ago with the end of the case study house program and the rapid acceleration of suburbanization. The discipline of architecture never regained its footing in the context of American housing as housing became a product subject to the efficiencies and economics of mass manufacture. The impact of suburban sprawl on energy, water, and transportation infrastructure was largely overlooked until its geographic consequences were firmly entrenched. The widespread growth of environmentalism has done little to assert a new identity for the American house. Whether produced individually or en masse, the American house remains a mixture of old forms, updated equipment, and engineered building products that mimic long abandoned methods of construction and long discarded lifestyles. This critique applies as much to the tract home as the dwell modern mid-century remix. Um, neither solution comprehensively addresses changing societal values or contributes significant significantly to contemporary design culture. Um, so we believe growing environmentalism should be met with design ingenuity, not product specification. A lasting contribution to sustainable development or the discipline is impossible when underperforming architectural and urban organization are simply reproduced using green branded products. So the succulent house addresses the uh, the, global is the pressing global issue of freshwater quality and supply as but one force to drive design ingenuity and improve environmental performance. Ultimately, this approach allows us to speculate on the organizational, spatial, and atmospheric potential of water collection on the American house. So we cited the house. Um, here's the kind of the, the the environmentalism is currently met with, with kind of equipment added on to kind of conventional housing stock. So you see like a, a synthetic wood barrel of plastic, rotoform, to collect water at a downspout, or um, underground cisterns or tanks, and these things are sort of added on to the architecture. Um, the section to the right is through the succulent house. So we did some analysis of just how much rainwater we might collect in a variety of different American um, contexts. And, and our ambition was to produce a series of kind of prototypical houses all customized to the rain cycles of uh, different geographic areas in the, in the states. We only produced one of them. It's um, for an urban lot in um, Chicago. It's basically a, about a 50 by 100 foot lot. And it um, assumes that this sort of re-urban, re, inhabitation of inner belt way areas in um, cities will continue. So this house basically replaces a house that um, uh, expired its lifespan. Um, and the house is designed um, uh, primarily as a result of two um, roofs that are inverted, and those roofs are um, 
the area of those roofs are maximized and the roofs are organized to collect water into a series of two storage cores around which um, uh, living is distributed. So these are the plans of the house. In the rear of the house, um, the kitchen and master suite surround um, a bladder wrapped winter garden. So it's basically an, an enclosed winter garden in the back. Our proposal argues that performance is not measured by quantitative methods alone. In fact, we draw on rainwater harvesting in large part because of its impact on the spaces we propose. Roofscape collection is experienced from the interior as the space rises and falls to meet the ceiling, and the collected water is stored in bladders that respond to changes in seasonal rainfall. Like its namesake plant, uh, plant, the bladders exhibit succulents in times of increased water supply. In times of low supply, the bladders are loose and drapery-like. As the bladders fill, the reflective surfaces capture views of adjacent conditions in unexpected ways. The succulent house alters the form and atmosphere of the house by integrating rainwater cycles into everyday life. So these are just diagrams of that. Um, and then um, on to a project called Ultramarine. Um, Ultramarine was commissioned for a um, gallery on Hollywood Boulevard in the heart of Hollywood. Um, the challenge was to transform the main gallery space into a public plaza for summer programming. Ultramarine is an immersive environment of iridescent color, a massive cloud of delicate undulations. The title refers both to the color of the piece and its meaning beyond the sea. Um, the installation, I should go back to this image, produces the physical sensations one feels when gazing at a cool body of water. Like the sea, its surface appears to be in a constant state of flux as the fabric curls and drapes in unexpected ways. Conceptually, Ultramarine produces an abstracted synthetic vision of the Southern California landscape into the gallery. It is at once the clear blue sky, the shimmering rhythmic surface of the sea, or a deep glistening swimming pool. And this was in response to um, a charge to make a public space in the gallery. So basically, the space had to remain unencumbered. There were a series of kind of events and workshops that were planned for the summer, but the um, executive director wanted to transform the atmosphere of the space, and so this was our solution. And it was also something that we did really quickly with really limited means, um, with not a lot of money, and um, so we modeled the project digitally, but the whole thing was produced by hand, um, with the exception of some templates. These templates, which we plotted in order to um, cut and stitch the material. So there are a series of, um, I think, 22 um, bands of fabric that are contoured in order to um, modulate the underbelly of the piece. And they're also darted, so a series of, of um, darts are cut in the top level of the piece. And the resulting effect, um, per uh, kind of fashion terminology, is called flounce. And you see this on your um, tablecloths. But essentially, by changing the length of the top edge and the bottom edge, we were able to very carefully choreograph um, these undulations and features that, um, that animate the surface even when uh, there's no air moving through the gallery. And I'll show you one more. Um, professional project. 
actually, I haven't opened it yet. Um, this is a project that we did last summer um, for the new Taipei City Museum of Art. Um, this was a competition. It wasn't a commission. Um, it uh, was a competition for a 36,000 square meter museum. It was a very um, large uh, museum on a kind of really what looked to be a floodplain adjacent to a major river in New Taipei City, which is outside of Taipei. Um, so our project attempted to use the kind of sheet logics foundation to produce an organization for the museum. And the museum had a, a very mixed um, bag of programmatic elements that they wanted to bring um, together from a research library to a children's museum, a contemporary art museum with both permanent and temporary exhibition space, and then a series of kind of museum amenities. Um, and there were a lot of security protocol between the research library, the children's museum, et cetera, and that influenced our massing uh, strategy. So this is, um, I think I'll just read the text. Um, Our proposal wears a loose cloak of color that sweeps lightly across the landscape, leaving elegant contours in its wake. Resembling large sails, the building's surfaces appear to flutter as lenticular color effects enliven its surfaces. The building's figure, let me go back. The building's figure remains elusive, like a body concealed behind a loose, address, loose dress. This elusiveness animates the project's changing silhouette and draws relationships between the project and the surrounding urban fabric. Despite its large scale, the museum experience is punctuated by unique and dramatic interior spaces. So this one here is the art plaza, which is at the um, kind of center of a series of clustered masses. And the entry to the museum is um, right on axis with this view. Um, and the surface of the building is pulled off to varying degrees from the kind of uh, superstructure of the building. And in the um, interior art plaza is the place it, where the surface is pulled off the most and space between the masses is formed. In this case, to produce a, um, a large lobby, a restaurant, ticketing, et cetera. So this is the site plan of the project. The river is to the right. Um, the city is to um, the upper left. And you can see, um, just in terms of the site plan drawing, that even by breaking up the kind of massing of the museum, the project is still a, a bit larger than the kind of general scale of the urban fabric. So um, we thought it was necessary to basically uh, subdivide and produce a series of kind of programmatic chunks so that the project um, would uh, would relate to the scale of the city. Um, and here you can see this kind of sheet operations that happen from kind of pinching um, the base of the project in order to make 
large figural voids in between the various parts, as well as to kind of tear open the envelope, um, fold it out, and join adjacent um, masses in order to produce space that wasn't governed by the kind of um, logic of the building's structural frame. And then here are a series of kind of diagrams which, if you studied, would illustrate the way in which um, different programmatic parts are kept independent from one another, but the series of kind of white um, equilateral plan shapes um, or hexagonal plan shapes are the place where those different audiences meet in between the more discreetly programmed areas. Um, and then uh, the ground floor plan, because the envelopes are pulled off of the masses and join or, um, or depart from the mass, the ground floor produces much more contiguous floor plate and space that allows all of the, well, many of the amenities of the museum to happen from the gift shop to the education center to um, the main restaurant ticketing and um, the lobby of the research library. Um, then this is the first floor plan and you can see in the plan the way in which the floor plate pulls away from the envelope and so the envelope would have its own secondary structure and it would basically be stabilized by the frame of the building within. And then these are other floor plans going up into the building. Um, the kind of color effects of the facade were produced through um, ceramic extrusions. There's a robust local ceramic industry here, so we attempted to um, to uh, draw a kind of rain screen system with a glazed glaze ceramic panels that would be attached to, to the facade of the building. So really all of the kind of effects of the surface are achieved through cosmetic means and through formal manipulation and, the, and very little um, aperture happen on the exterior of the building is the section through the building and it shows the place adjacent to the center art, central art plaza where the lobby is um, formed by the, the surfaces joining together and draping into the space. This is the facade of the building from the, um, from the adjacent road and the landscape um, the surrounding landscape is manipulated to sort of to pu be pulled up or pushed down in relation to the base of the building so that it allows you to have several um, types of connection with the landscape and allows us to hide service and, and kind of buffer the um, museum from the adjacent road. And then these are two um, additional interior views. The one on the right shows the lobby. The one on the left um, is showing the termination of one of the figural voids, um, which organizes circulation in between the various wings of the project. And then, um, I have just one more thing to show. I was told to keep it to about an hour, so I'm doing pretty well. So the last thing that, um, that I will show is, and this is actually the the oldest research, it's the first part of the research, which um, is at the, f at, um, the finest scale. Um, this is a digital fabrication seminar, which um, 
I taught uh, starting, I think, in 07 for um, two to three years. And the name of the course was um, Between the Sheets, Developing Superform Aluminum with Plastic. Um, the kind of thesis of the class was that, um, well, let's say the, the thesis by the end of the class um, was that uh, material reality has become plastic, technology of design and technology of manufacture alters materiality, breeding what can be called synthetic materiality. This is a constructed set of surface effects resulting from the mixture of act actual material properties and the geometrically induced properties of digital operations. In the most captivating mixtures, the real and virtual become so intertwined that one perceives a new synthetic materiality. The optical and tactile sensations produced by these surfaces bring a new lushness to design research. Um, so um, to introduce it, um, the, the course was designed um, as a response to, um, to the use of digital fabrication in the design studio. And at the time, I, I found that um, digital production tools, like fabrication tools, were becoming the constraint to which students would design their projects. So students would decide what their building would be based on what model making technologies were available at the school. And I thought that that was really curious. And I was interested in kind of reinstating the capacity of digital fabrication to be used as a prototyping method. So, um, so I shifted scale um, toward one-to-one -one production. And I introduced the students to a particular manufacturer and a particular manufacturing technology and its economic constraints and asked them to use those criteria um, at the outset of the design process so that they would be designing in the face of those constraints instead of attempting to redesign with knowledge of those constraints later or attempting to find a manufacturing system that would allow a design that had already been conceived to be produced. So um, these are just a series of images of some of the projects. And so the design problem was formulated um, uh, around three technological shifts that seemed to be, um, that were pertinent and that could be um, responded to in the design of facades. So the first is just the kind of contemporary reliance on curtain wall technology, which had begun to move toward, to swerve toward rain screen technology, where the requirement of the weather tightness was no longer coincident with the exterior most surface of the facade. And lastly, with the ability of, of digital representation and design to control far greater amounts of data than we had been able to control before and for that information to be sent to machines um, for the purposes of production. So the students were given the manufacturing input of a company called Superform. They were started in Great Britain. They're located in Riverside, California. They make automotive and aircraft parts that are impossible to make through stamping or are too expensive to make through stamping. And instead, they make it through thermoforming using one um, one part molds instead of matching dyes. So by using one part molds, um, you can really reduce the cost of molds and you can, um, uh, you can also make 
things that a two-part mold wouldn't be able to make at tolerances that um, are more suited for um, certain kinds of automotive parts and aircraft parts. So because these are heat formed, there's no stress that's um, accumulated in the part post-production. So if you're using two-part cold forming method, then residual stress stays in the metal. This is done with an aluminum alloy that behaves plastically under the introduction of heat and pressure. And so the, at a molecular level, the grains of the metal are realigned and stresses aren't held in the piece. So you know exactly what kind of part you're going to get to really tight degrees of dimensional tolerance because you get rid of that stress. Um, these are some of the parts of aircraft that are produced using this technology. And they like to say that their production method works well at the, at the uh, when part count is in the low thousands. So not in the millions, so you're not gonna make a Prius, or I don't even know how many Prius they make, but you're not gonna make a Honda Civic using this technology, but you can make a special edition Ford GT Mustang, which they made something of. So here's how it works. This is um, the chamber in which, um, in which a mold um, is attached, and this is made in either steel or cast iron or some sort of metal, it has to withstand high temperatures, and then they put a sheet of aluminum in there and they apply pressure and heat and then they post process this by trimming it and they get an engine lip skin, which is a great word, lip skin. Um, and so my students, the reason the course is called Between the Sheets is because they had to negotiate two constraint sets which were really close to one another, and that's what allowed them to do it. They were producing in plastic using vacu vacuum forming technology in-house in our shop at UCLA, but they were, were doing that such that they were meeting the manufacturing constraints of superforming. And then they did post-processing, um, just like superform does, though with three axis mills instead of five axis mills and with uh, you know, lesser degrees of dimensional tolerance. So in order to do that, the students, um, I often find like in, par in parametrically designed projects where you see 14,000 pieces and each one is slightly different from the next because it's optimizing a particular input like solar orientation. And what I find curious and sort of um, curious about those techniques is that they're not at all um, optimizing economy or any other system to which architecture is beholden um, if it makes its way off of paper, off of the monitor, and into the world. So I uh, insisted that my students use only one or two parts so that they would be producing one or two molds they could affordably produce, and that we would be um, designing our facade systems with those constraints so that we really could produce these using the technology. So in order to do that, we generated a series of uh, shared techniques um, and vocabulary. The first shared technique was called plain tiling. This is basically tessellation where when you array the panels, when you array the unit, you don't have any gaps. And then we had to define the tile boundary, which was the edge, the edge boundary of each unit. And then we, um, we all worked with something called field line work, which was essentially another system of geometry which would help us obfuscate, if we wanted to, the tile boundary. And this would also allow us to 
array our tile in different ways in order to produce different surface effects. So instead of imagining that all the panels get put together in an identical way every time they're used, we intentionally wanted them to go together in different ways. And then we had substrate line work, was, which was essentially the framework with which you would attach this system to the building. So we tried to simplify that system. And then panel morphology, which was the surface dis disposition of the surface that got stretched between the, you know, across the tile. Um, so um, the resulting projects um, basically shift aluminum's intrinsic qualities to it by um, introducing new geometry, um, the intrinsic qualities of aluminum are produced synthetically as a range of, and can be associated with a range of materials, whether it be wrinkled satin, carved marble, stretched latex, um, organic membranes, armor, or cast ceramic. So these are just a series of projects that were produced. And then each project, as it grappled with the constraints of the um, manufacturing system, kind of um, uh, found their own uh, kind of place to locate the research. So this one called, and I'll really briefly describe them in order to isolate what their findings were. Satin sheet is a two-tile system. It yielded 72 standard panel combinations, which were carefully categorized by the designers. A dichroic paint finish heightens the sensation of continual movement that the field line work instigates optically. The surface recedes and approaches rhythmically as one's movement alters the surface's color. The field line work progresses linearly, curls, tangles, and moves again depending on panel orientation. This one's called Bust a Line. It's a single tile system. It uses something called tool inserts to economically produce a field of wild variation. So here the students um, put a series of extruded plates of varying heights uh, into the mold and that could be changed every time a part was produced so that they were able to allow the field, allow the unit boundary to advance or recede depending on um, whether and which tool inserts they inserted. Um, shiatsu took advantage of the duration of thermoforming of the thermoforming process to modulate air pressure through a series of independent chambers. So rather than design a mold, they designed a mechanism for distributing air pressure so that the air pressure could be used um, almost like the choreography of music to distribute a variety of features across the surface. Um, this one's called Point Blank. Um, Point Blank is in a later class. Um, they used two manufacturing systems because they didn't like my two unit rule. So they have four units. Two are stamped. So they're done with kind of low, lower tech technology. Um, and then two are super formed. And they use um, kind of aggregated units. So they have um, single hexes, quad hexes, and tri triads of hexes in order to get more, uh, more organic, less mathematically discernible array. And in this particular course, we, um, I threw in the challenge of terminating the facade and adding folds so the students had to design corners, an approach to the corner and an approach to the top or bottom of the system. This one is called um, 
tongue in cheek. This one um, uses two units, a slightly convex unit and a slightly concave unit in order to produce um, uh, curvature through panel aggregation. And they also have a kind of interesting and clever um, way around uh, thermoforming's uh, um, reluctance to accept undercuts. So they have what looks like something impossible to manufacture in a thermoformed process, but they're able to do it based on the orientation of the mold in the oven. And then this is their installation showing the double curvature of the system. And they allow the kind of um, slumping of the panel surface to hide the continuity of the diagonal seams. Um, this is called intestines and roses. Intestines and roses worked to, um, to hide the unit boundary by allowing the field line work to give the character to the unit boundary. So like a deep um, kind of loop pile carpet, the unit is lost in the kind of thickness of the parts. Um, this is called Nurples. Nurples uses a similar strategy to intestines and roses. Um, its real, ed, real departure from that was just in its kind of post-processing strategy. They developed a series of masks so that they were able to give um, singular color approaches, kind of painterly color approaches to the array. Um, this one really was a development of an attachment system. So they used an equilateral triangle. They used field line work. Um, it's quite similar to something like satin sheets, but because they used an equilateral triangle and designed the connection method, they were able to get convex and concave curvature um, and still allow the parts to link up to one another. And then at the end of that, um, that teaching, um, Superform um, agreed to take an existing mold that they had, so basically a chamber, it was a relatively small chamber, and allow me to do a single tile. So for a show in New York uh, called Matters of Sensation at Artist Space, we, we produced 50 um, aluminum panels, and so we used one millimeter, um, one millimeter aluminum sheet. And by the time it was formed, it was half a millimeter thick, so it was a thirty-second of an inch thick. You could jump up and down on it. It's extraordinarily strong because it's thermoformed and um, and very lightweight. So this is essentially a series of three. Um, elements and and it was I have to say much harder to develop the model that would be adequate for the production than I had thought it would be but I was really shocked at the um, the fineness with which features could be produced in the manufacturing process so we had attempted to see what the smallest feature we could get into the piece was, and we kind of wanted it to be more like jewelry, that you could, it would uh, behave at a distant scale, but it would also have features that you'd only see when you were up close. So here's the kind of, we made a, we took a block of aluminum and milled the mold, um, and then that got attached to an existing housing, and then this is sort of the way the piece was cleaned and produced, and then we um, attached it to a substrate for the gallery. So that's it. Thank you.
Well, she gave me a bit of a pet. I have, there's a loophole in her question, which I am going to expand and um, walk. This is the question that Mabel Wilson asked about the ethical dimension of architecture. Where does this The direct uh, translation of digital information to a machine and and I think it's easy to avoid that question by saying that that never happens and that humans intervene all of the time because we we don't produce things in the world through single systems so we're not we there are some people who want to and are trying to 3d print a building but there in digital manufacturing, there are numerous systems that are brought together. So the role of, of, craft, of the craftsperson in the f production is still part of the production of digitally fabricated things. And the role of judgment happens all through the process from the judgment that a designer exercises through the judgment of the whole team of people that are working on the project. So I don't think that it, it eliminates the role of ethics in architecture to use a different tool to send instructions to other tools. They're all just means to an end. And the role of ethics is in how you evaluate the byproducts of the thing that you've produced. So how does it make people behave? Um, how does it organize, um, organize behavior? How does it organize cities? And all of those things are where the role of ethics still exists. into it extensively, but I, um, I have sort of, I've had two, basically two thoughts about ornament just in thinking about what other people are producing because I, I think there's, I often feel like there's not enough uh, post-analysis or conceptualization of what's happening in architecture right now or in the last five years. So a lot of this work is coming out of wondering about what other people are doing and what's the role of color or texture or materiality in architecture. So I think the role of ornament, that in the last 10 years, ornaments played two different roles. One, um, one relates to um, the production of new, quali new surface qualities. And those qualities are what, what I was terming synthetic materiality, that they're qualities that are produced because we can, uh, we can control geometry and we can introduce geometry in into the field of the surface, not just at its edges. So we introduce it through ceramic frit technology or through um, milling um, technology or through um, cutting technology. And by introducing um, this extra material, this extra geometry to material, whether it be through color, line work, texture, it, uh, it shifts the qualities of that surface away from uh, plywood, aluminum, um, concrete, toward other things. And um, we have different kind of physical responses to those materials when we look at them. So I think ornament has become 
um, associated with a range of materials that aren't native to um, to architecture. It expands the qualities surfaces can have without really expanding the array of materials we use. So that's one. And the other is that when you do those sorts of things to the surface, when you um, work technically on the surface, I think that it's theoretical work on space. So when you see something like Gary's IAC building and you see that his, um, his mylar, kind of mirrored mylar and film models in his office are basically mixed with curtain wall technology and you have a product that we see and he's mixing lots of things, ceramic frit technology, curtain wall technology, slump glass forming and the architectural, a novel architectural model and the spatial effect of that is one of kind of it, it seems to me like that building is under internal pressure. So all of the kind of decisions that are made about the surface makes the building appear like the space is under pressure, that the insides are bigger than the container that's trying to contain it. And so I think that that's different than, than a kind of modernist idea of space as something that's geometrically controlled but not, um, not of a substance. So it's basically an empty abstract medium rather than a medium with, um, with quality, with um, substance. So those are two ways that I think ornament has disciplinary implications in architecture. Um, there are many others, I'm sure. The design and documentation was just two of us. It was um, me and a former student, and um, she worked for me for four and a half years and just recently moved to Boston, so I'm finishing it. But it was really just two of us. And then we have a like fantastic contractor who um, who is really careful and meticulous and has good craft. And then we also just made decisions that allowed the hardest things to make um, have some tolerance in them. So the contractor, he calls me, his son is working with him and he calls me two by eight because I made the walls in two by six framing, but he thinks I should have made it, them in two by eight framing. So there was a lot of, you know, kind of furring out and adjusting because I didn't leave quite enough tolerance in the wall for the location of the steel columns because in a seismic zone, those steel columns are actually attached directly to the footings. So they come long before you have a lot of surveyed geometry to help you locate them. And so, you know, it was, a little tricky for him to get them in that tight wall because they're five and a half inch diameter round pipe. I think it depends on the project. I would say there, 
with the with outside of what sort of pleasurable effects does this produce with what kinds of it, with the use of what kinds of economies between the sheets wasn't asking other questions i mean it was asking disciplinary questions like how would you terminate that how would you meet the ground? How would you cut an aperture in that surface? And so those were formal disciplinary questions. And that, that was the extent to which there was a conversation. So it kind of de depends on the problem. There are other courses, like I showed the sort of splayed open fabric model. And students there were working on a Hollywood site where there's a kind of density bonus for new development. And they were trying to think of, trying to conceive of what public space might look like in Hollywood. Because public space in, in Los Angeles at all is really hard to come by. Um, so they had urban, um, urban ambitions for their project. But I, I think when teaching, um, it is okay. I, I think it's most productive in teaching if you're able to bracket the terms with which the, the product is meant to respond. So I'm comfortable saying that we are going to isolate this area of work and talk as with expertise in this bandwidth for this particular project. In professional practice, I think it's, it's very different. So, um, you know, the bandwidth across which a project has to be able to, uh, to negotiate is much broader. But in, in research-oriented teaching, I think you can only generate expertise if you focus the problem that you're working on. So um, uh, Mabel's question is a question that resides in her own bandwidth, and it's not, it's not the bandwidth of my practice, nor is it the bandwidth of my teaching. So the underlying question is, why are you doing this? Aren't, doesn't that mean you're not doing that? And I would say, yes, it does mean that I'm not doing that. Um, but, I, but I don't think it means that there aren't implications. It's just not the primary motivator of the work that I do. I, 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 I always want things to work at a, um, through um, different frameworks of judgment. So mine tend to be more about assembly, tectonics, space making. They're not primarily um, programmatic, but I think that you know I, I think they have to work through all of those systems, and I'm probably more expert at some of them and more naive about others. So, but that's not to say that I don't think they shouldn't do something, though I do believe, for example, that, um, that social activism is best done through laws and your political orientation and the people you elect to government office than it is through an architecture practice. And so maybe that's why I'm not in government and I am an architect and I hold that view. So I think, you know, obviously personal, um, 
right? values and interests and beliefs play into what you do. For me, my favorite part of that building is not necessarily the texture, it's the fact that the facade slips off and becomes the cornice, and that there is no seam between the cornice and the facade, but it rolls into the cornice. And so to me, that's the most um, potent part of that building, because that's such a radical thing to have done, is to actually blend one surface with the kind of componentry of the cornice and to fuse those, those components that serve different roles at that time.